Let's take a break from our in-studio concert and join Alan as he discusses improvising, along with his 10 most useful scales. Well, I guess in the beginning I uh, wanted to learn how to improvise. I was always interested in that. And uh, I knew that if I wanted to improvise over code changes, I'd have to um, figure out, you know, all the scales that went with all those chords. So, um, because I was particularly stubborn, and uh, my dad was always around to help me, but I didn't like to ask him because I wanted to uh, figure it out on my own. Yeah, sure. But, um, so I guess I started out trying to figure everything out by using math. So I started out um, using a fixed number, like say the number one, because of the transposing nature of stringed instruments, you can uh, transpose real easy, which is something you can't do on other instruments. So I figured if I just started out with, say, uh, five note scales, then I could take, uh, just permutate them all, like one through five, then one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, four, seven, et cetera, through to 12. And then I'd do the same with uh, six notes, seven notes, eight notes, and nine notes. And then I uh, cataloged them and filed them away and uh, threw away all the ones that had more than four semitones in a row, in a straight row. And I just analyzed them and looked at them until I could see uh, chords within them. And then I realized that um, the way I think about chords is they're just parts of the scale that are played simultaneously. And as the code changes go by, I don't so much think about a static chord voicing staying at all changing. I just see like the whole of the notes on the neck change. And uh, I guess for me, the only thing that makes one scale different from another is not the starting note, it's um, the separation of the intervals. For example, if it's a D minor major 7 scale, I, the name which I give to a scale is only a name, is only a means of identification. It's for no other purpose. So when I, when I think of that scale, I don't think of it as starting on D. I think of it as it starts at the lowest available note on my instrument, which would be um, an E, and the highest available note, which would be another E, the high E. So uh, that's basically how I think of scales. Um, what I've done is I've figured out what I would say would be 10 really usable scales that you could use for playing over most, most anything. And there are plenty more, believe me, but um, these I think are the most usable ones. What you see here is all the notes of um, a C major scale all at once from one end of the guitar to the other. And that's basically how I see scales. I see them from the lowest note to the highest note. Um, I don't have a different name for a different scale that starts on any one of these notes, which there is. You can practically name any scale, come up with a different name from any note that you can start on. But for me, for the way my music is, it didn't really help. It was kind of a hindrance, really. So I abbreviated it to these symbols. And this first one, which is which means really like a D minor with a natural six to me. So that's what this is. And like I said, when I see scales, I see them the whole guitar neck like that. So it's just up to me to, um, to uh, juggle the notes around and improvise and make melodies out of them. I think a good way to begin practicing scales basically is to try playing more than three notes on a string just so you can break away from playing in a pattern like this uh, F major or something like that. And just start thinking of it more like that. That way you end up in different parts of the guitar. You know, you can start on a low F and end up on a high A or something. I guess the only thing I can say to help maybe people think about how to look at the whole fingerboard as one and 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 kind of juggle it around is to, if I played something real simple from like a, a, just a C major scale, just to maybe you could see that it could go an awful lot further than this. Mm -hmm. 
just as an example of um, juggling things around. <laughs> This is a D minor major 7 scale. Uh, this is my symbol for that, which is probably completely meaningless to anybody else but me, but that's okay. And uh, what I'm going to do later, actually, and also in the booklet, is to show you how, uh, how you can find chords in amongst all this, because, uh, like I said, I see the whole thing from top to bottom. So I can see these chord shapes in there, you know, like an A augmented chord, and, of course, the, the minor major 7. Um, but I guess we'll go into that in more detail in the booklet. All of these scales that I've given here are not the same scales with different names. They're actually different based on the fact that they have different interval permutations. So this scale is um, an A minor major 7 and a flat 6. Um, this is my symbol for that which, of course, again, is completely meaningless to anyone but me. But um, this is that scale. Um, this scale is um, what I call a, a minor a major 7 with a raised 4th. And um, I like this scale a lot. Some people refer to it as a harmonic major scale. Like if I played this in E, which um, I used in one tune from a, a while ago on the old IOU album, there was an E pedal section in, the, in a tune called Letters of Mark, it was based kind of on this scale, really. And uh, I've heard some people call that scale a B harmonic major, but for me, like I said, I always relate them to the, to the closest minor in, in my head, if there is anything in my head. <laughs> um, this is the crazy symbol that I use for that, and uh, the chords I was talking about were just... Uh, <laughs> All of those chords just come from that one scale. Uh, this next scale is a symmetrical scale. It's just uh, what I call a double diminished scale. I think uh, most people just refer to it as a diminished scale. So it's just the, um, this one. Um, the actual name for it is usually a half step away from the name that I use because I always think of this scale as being related to an altered dominant chord. For example, if, if, um, if I played this scale, which is essentially these notes, um, it's actually a G sharp diminished chord. But I think of it more as being like a, you know, like a, a G7 flat 9 chord. So uh, that's why I use that name. Again, like I said, the name might be a little confusing, but the scale is good, it works. Like, um, like I said before, you can find all these hidden chords within these scales, and, which I'll kind of show you how to find uh, later or, or, and in the booklet. But like this one, for example, it's got these... Uh, This scale is a, a very usable scale because it, it's very um, easy to disguise. But at the same time, if you play it in certain other ways, it's too recognizable and sounds pretty lame. So I always try and, uh, with this particular scale, always juggle the notes around a lot so that it's um, more difficult to identify. But yet, when you're listening to it, you can hear some kind of logic in there. These next three scales are what I just refer to them as basically kind of like jazz scales, but I don't use these particular three a lot, but I think it's really good to know them, so here they are. This is just like a, a B-flat major scale, um, but it has the raised fifth in it as well. So essentially, that's what that is. It's, uh, Those are, those are the notes in that. Um, this scale, I guess, um, again, this is my crazy symbol for it. 
and I just call it a C dominant seven scale. It just it's basically just like a regular C major scale, but it, it has the flat seven in it as well, so it's just like. Um, Etc. In terms of trying to communicate it, I think I'd call it um, a jazz minor scale. It's just uh, in this in this particular key, it's it's in B minor and it has the natural seven and the raised seven in it. This is the second of the minor jazz scales, and the, this one's in A. And it's the only difference between this one and the other one is they both of the jazz minor scales have the raised seven but the previous one had the natural seven in it and uh, this one doesn't, it just has the race seven, the sixth, the flat six or the race fifth, however you want to look at it. Well before I tell you about this last scale, um, there's obviously a, a lot of scales and the thing is that a lot of them that I've experimented with don't complete themselves in one octave, they take two octaves and sometimes three. But um, rather than trying to get into those right now is um, this particular scale I've used quite a lot as a scale to modulate from one code to another or you know for, or because it has a it's a symmetrical scale so it has a sound that you can recognize when you when you kind of hear it and uh, I'm not sure how you go about naming what key it belongs to um, but for me I uh, think of this one as basically uh, like a C minor because a C minor, an E minor or an A flat minor because here you've got like the A flat minor and an A flat major triad an A flat, uh, a G minor and a G major triad at the same time but as you can see it's a perfectly symmetrical scale so you can have some fun with that one I try not to practice anything that I'm going to play in as much as like I don't learn any particular licks or something that I can just play so I'm stringing a bunch of licks together because that's not the way I think about improvising. I just think again about all of the notes you know that are available and you just try and make melodies out of them and don't let your hands dictate what you think you can do. Take a look at those fingerboard charts and imagine your eyes like dancing on the notes that you want to play and then forget about whether your hands can do it or not, or just try it. Like I said, a name is only to transmit the information or to communicate it to someone else. And, and really the communication that we're doing, that we're speaking about really, is music, which you don't shout the changes to the people, you, they only hear the, the music and uh, that's the only thing that matters. <laughs>